So um, let me welcome everybody to the to our um, next iteration of the Search Mastery Speaker Series, where we explore the foundations and practice of search, and education, and literacy. And we're really, really happy today to have uh, to have Devin uh, West from the University of Washington uh, with us to talk about search engines as gates and gateways to um, to information. Devin is. Um, uh, uh, Jevin West is an associate professor in the Information School at the University of Washington. He is the co-founder of the new of the new Center for an Informed Public at UW, aimed at resisting um, resisting strategic misinformation, promoting an informed society, and strengthening democratic discourse. He is also the co-founder of the Data Lab at UW, a data science fellow at the e Science Institute and affiliate faculty for the Center for Statistics and Social Sciences. His research and teaching focus on the impact of data and technology on science and society and on slowing the spread of information. He is the co-author of the new book, Calling Bullshit, The Art of Skepticism in a Data-Driven World, which helps non-experts question numbers, data, and statistics without an advanced degree in data science. Um, I want to... I want to show you guys the book, Calling Bullshit. Um, and I, I, I recommend this book. It's published in, um, in 2021. And I am planning to give it uh, to a number of people as, as a holiday gift. So this is, uh, this is the book. And um, Devin, I will just turn things over. Uh, Jevin, sorry. I will just um, turn things over to you to um, introduce your topic a little bit more and, um, and, and tell us what you know. Awesome. Thanks so much, Marianne. Thanks for the invitation and thanks for all that are joining uh, today. I wish I was there in person, but uh, now that we can do this virtually better, that I think we can we can take advantage of these opportunities. And thanks for you know promoting the book. <laughs> That's a funny kind of gift, but maybe it'll be a fun <laughs> discussion um, mm -hmm. over the holiday. I'll, I'll mention a few of the things from the book, but I'm mostly going to talk about search, um, mostly as a gateway to misinformation, um, but also as a gate to misinformation as well. And what I mean by gate is that, th that actually search engines can do a pretty good job at slowing the spread of misinformation. And I'm going to focus primarily on two studies that we've done um, in my group, um, and we'll uh, you know talk about some of the other projects that we're working on, but, but mostly focused on two different studies. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. Just gotta get this right here. Okay, share screen. Whoops, sorry, I should be faster at this given how many times we've all done this. All right, so uh, let's just jump right into it. Um, and to start, because we're talking about search, uh, I wanna um, talk about uh, some of the fun ways that search engines can um, both tell us things about the world and, and sometimes be a mis little misleading about the world. So let me start with a story about Rosie um, the wolf snail. Rosie the wolf snail is one of the more amazing snails out there if you haven't heard of this particular snail. It's pretty scary though. It's one of these snails um, that essentially destroys all other snails in, in really kind of awful ways um, because uh, it's uh, so aggressive and, and, and so much, I guess you could even think it's so much faster than some of the other snails, it's it's actually taken out, I think a half a dozen species in Hawaii. Um, and it's it's a real concern to biologists. But aside from all its destruction, you may ask if you're at the dinner table, well, then what makes Rosie the snail so amazing? Actually, they call it ca the cannibal snail sometimes too, because it's so destructive. Um, and you might sort of start guessing at what makes it so, um, you know, what gives it superpowers? How fast is it? So what would we do um, if we were sitting around the dinner table and I guess we had a computer or our phones, we might say, well, let's let's all take a guess at how fast Rosie the snail moves. Um, and if you go to Google and you search something like this, you would see, you know, you search Rosie the wolf snail speed, um, you would expect to see, um, you know, an answer. And you do, you get that from Google. So if you do that search, you find that Rosie, the snail goes approximately 19 miles per hour. Holy mackerel, a snail that can move 19 miles an hour. And I think if we were all around that dinner table, we'd go, oh, I'm not so sure we believe that. 
Um, and as someone who teaches classes on calling BS, I would certainly call BS on a snail being able to, to move 19 miles an hour. But that's the first thing that shows up on Google. And for many people, including myself, and I guess most people that use the web, if we have a question, we just, we Google it, right? Or we Bing it or whatever. We use search engines to try to figure out the, you know, what, what is reality? Um, and we can use that as our, as, our, our, as our gateway to that kind of information. But of course, this is not a perfect tool. And one of the messages that I want to certainly drive home <laughs> in parts of the talk today is that it's not a perfect um, uh, gateway to good information. A lot of times it becomes a gateway to misinformation. And by the way, if you search this too in other forms, actually I did a recent update on this search, you find you have these little, if you see here in the red on the, the side here, approximately 19 miles per hour when you read about the about. Um, and there's some explanations why this pops up is 19 miles an hour. My students and I have kind of looked into these kinds of examples. Why, how could it be so wrong? Um, and it, it, it real, of course, it, it involves um, how these search engines do their scraping and how they organize that data and how they present that data. But certainly Google is not reality. Um, uh, but unfortunately, that's what a lot of us sort of um, subscribe to um, because we use this so much. So that's kind of the main point here. The search engines are not always a reflection of reality. And that's why we have to be careful um, when using these really powerful search and are these really powerful tools that we need to navigate and to, to search through all the, the, the large uh, information piles that we're always trying to deal with from day to day. But let me talk about um, some recent things. And this is just in the last couple of days. I talked about this in my lecture yesterday to students um, with my colleague Carl Bergstrom about this new tool that was released um, some, by some researchers called Galactica. And it's, it's in this family of tools um, that are coming out from the natural language processing world that uh, are allowing um, individuals, to, or actually it's a, you know, it's a, the, the programs themselves are essentially generating texts that are very human-like. And Galactica is a, is a tool uh, that came out of a research group that trained some of these sophisticated NLP models on very large corpus of uh, scientific knowledge. And their claim is that they're now generating uh, scientific knowledge, auto-generating using these language models. And that's right there where I'll say, no, you're not generating knowledge, you're generating text that looks uh, presumably conversant based on conversations in this text. It doesn't really understand science, but that's over the last couple of days, there's been a lot of attention around this tool called Galactica that allows you to create lecture notes, Wikipedia entries here. It can create, um, you know, it can suggest citations, et cetera. And that's exciting in many ways, but it's also very concerning because of the, the kind of text that it could generate to, let's say, overflood Wikipedia with entries that are just not actually all that great. And you you do find that it weren't, runs quite well. We did an example, we did some examples in class yesterday where we said, okay, let's have it write about antibiotic resistance. And it wrote some reasonably good lecture notes about antibiotic resistance. Pretty powerful and pretty, pretty scary at the same time. But if you had it search for things that maybe weren't as well known as antibiotic resistance, something called like Brandolini's law, which is something we talk about, I talk about um, in uh, our book, um, it's a law essentially that um, that you know, it, it takes orders of magnitude more effort to clean up bullshit than it does to create it. And if you allow this Galactica tool to tell me something about Brandolini's law, this is what it says. It says Brandolini's law is a theory in economics proposed, proposed by this Brandolini professor at University of Padua, which states that the smaller the economic unit, the greater its efficiency, blah, blah, blah. Well, I won't read, keep reading it because I have lots more content that I want to show today and, and leave time for some questions. But here's the point. This is all essentially made up. This is not, this is essentially bullshit. This is not Brandolini's law. Um, and it's not um, even something that as far as I, as far, as far as I know, even exists. I don't even know if this individual exists at the University of Padu. Um, if you go to the actual Wikipedia entry on Brandolini's law, so the one on the right is the actual entry right now that was hopefully entered by humans. I think it was. Um, and this is at least my understanding of Brandolini's law. This is the bullshit asymmetry principle that I just mentioned. And so the point here, and this is something that my colleague Carl Bergstrom and I have been talking a lot about. We're going to be talking about actually right after <laughs> this lecture that I give. Uh, we have some colleagues we're getting together on this particular topic um, that 
when you look at these kinds of examples, it's really not at all understanding what the, the text. It's very good at essentially bullshitting, creating content uh, regardless of whether it's reality or not. And so that's a concern. And that's what we, I, I feel like um, it's, a, it's an important topic to bring up when talking about search engines now, because now we have these language models that run a lot of these search engines and also um, these, these search engines depend on text and content generation. And if content generation is so easy to create now, it's gonna create new challenges. So I just wanted to make that point before going forward, especially because this is just a hot off the press kind of news. And so that's the main point I wanna kind of stress in the research that we done, we've done in my group and also just the research that I've read in the literature. One of the big things is that it's one thing to um, understand the actual text um, that's being generated to create essentially um, to to create you know probabilities associated with different uh, text uh, uh, strings and and just uh, words themselves. That's one thing to create things that look like they've been written by humans. It's another thing to actually understand science. So it's we can understand scientific text, but I don't think we're at the point where this text actually understands science. And that's kind of the claims that are being made right now. And that, the reason why that's important, because as we search in this new content that's being created, we have to be careful about what it says and what it doesn't say. But let me just say something more basic about search engines, too, back to this point about reality or non-reality. Um, not too long ago, my, my son and I were looking at the International Space Station on YouTube, um, and this is something that we enjoy doing. It's, you know, there's a YouTube uh, channel where you can sit there and watch as the International Space Station goes around the Earth in around 90 minutes. It's this amazing thing where you can see all the parts of the Earth that it's seeing. Um, and as I was watching it one night, I started to look at the recommendations that were provided by uh, YouTube. And here, as I'm looking at this spherical object, here's what it, you know, recommends that I should be looking at. 10 strange things you didn't know about the Earth. You know, you know, flat, is, is Earth actually flat? So these, this is what we're contending with with our search engines too, especially in an ad-driven world where our search engines are, are really, in many ways, not just trying to deliver good content, it's trying to just deliver content to grab our attention, which again, if um, you know, in my class on calling bullshit, you find that that sort of is exactly what bullshit is. It's, it disregards truth, it just wants to grab your, you know, bullshit or just wants to grab your attention. And that's what we're contending with as well when we're when we're you know dealing with the search engines that again are so powerful and so useful in today's world, but still have these flaws that we have to be aware of as consumers of these search engines. But it really can get problematic when these search engines don't just like recommend flat Earth uh, kinds of videos to to keep me gl gl glued to the screen and glued to potentially. Uh, the ad environment that that I'm in, but it can do things like, um, you know, create essentially, uh, you know, collections of databases for uh, basically an open gate for pedophiles. This was reported in several different uh, uh, news agencies back in 2019. And there were some responses from these technology companies to make changes, especially with things as, as, as terrible as, as this. Uh, but it shows that you know, we have, there's a lot of work to be done when we think about designing these search engines and also informing people on how to use those search engines, because this is just what people find. This isn't what still exists out there. Um, it's, we only have so many researchers and journalists looking out for these things, and, and of course, digital citizens, uh, but there, this is just, you know, again, just the tip of the iceberg of things that we need to be aware of. So again, search engines no, are not always a reflection of reality, given some examples of this. But let me explain, you know, even um, probably uh, in the most, yeah, I would say this is probably the most basic thing that we should know, but we, we don't do a good enough job reminding our students and the public when we're teaching them about using search engines. And that is that um, just because something shows up on Google doesn't mean it's sort of reality. And so we play this game in my lab a lot of times where we'll say, okay, find, come up with the most preposterous question you could ever come up with. Um, something that you think will not show up on Google. And it turns out it's almost impossible. So one of the things we did quite a while ago, this is one of the first ones we did, that's why I'm showing this one now, but we have, of course, tons and tons of other examples. My colleague and I thought, okay, so there was this discussions about vaccinations and, and sort of the people's concerned effects of these vaccinations. And so we thought, oh, let's come up with something like this. Do vaccinations cause shaken baby syndrome? 
this couldn't possibly have any website that uh, that links vaccinations with shaken baby syndrome. They're completely, of course, very, very different things. No way that something's going to pop up. Well, if you do that search, lo and behold, here you have dangerous vaccines found to cause symptoms of shaken baby syndrome. When is shaken baby syndrome? Possibly vaccine injury instead. There's there's no way that fact checkers and, and researchers can stop everything that's created out there, but search engines are gobbling everything up. And so they'll throw these things on there. And so when people come up with the most preposterous things that might exist, they search it and they say, ah, see, there are people talking about it. So if, you're, if you want to find something uh, or something to support your ideas, you can find it on the web and search engines will find your way to that website without just a little bit of work. And so that's another thing that we have to make sure that the public is aware of. And actually, this happens, of course, on other products, not just the Google, but like uh, Google and Bing and other places like that. They're, they're found on search engines from these other major platforms like YouTube, of course. Um, and so let me give you an example of that. So um, this was er, uh, earlier on uh, when QAnon was really starting to, to sort of uh, come on to the, the to sort of national and international scene. Um, and it, there was uh, there was all these discussions about this company in Mexico. Uh, this is cement company uh, that was doing all this trafficking. Of course, these are are not uh, uh, this isn't true. But of course, this is being created by QAnon networks. And if you actually searched Cemex on uh, which is a major multi billion dollar international company um, on YouTube, you wouldn't find videos about the company, sort of how they deliver, how they make the cement, everything. This is what you find. Semex company child trafficking scandal, trafficking camp, you know, more camps by yet another Semex plant. These are QAnon. Uh, this is a QAnon network that was claiming that this company was involved with um, uh, human, these human tra child trafficking. And so the search engines are incredibly susceptible to these kinds of uh, hijackings um, of reality. And, and, and if they're, and these are some of the biggest, of course, um, technology platforms with the most resources to try to um, try to avoid these things, and it still is quite problematic. So this is another, just yet another example of the the issues that can can occur with search engines. And also, I should say that interface design itself is not a neutral bystander. It's not just the data collection and the recommendation systems. It's very much also the interface design that's not a neutral bystander when when information foraging. And you can see that with some of these, you know, these really powerful tools like, um, you know, autocomplete that are actually using some of these natural language processing, uh, you know, models like Clip and others that are, are providing this really powerful tool. But it also shows how different um, the sort of reality is for major, different major search engines. Some of you may have seen this example. I love this example because it shows how different at least sort of the world of Facebook is and, and Google, two very, very large um, online environments. But if you search like my husband is on Facebook, you'd find my best friend, my life, awesome, me, everything, you know, my love. If you did the exact same thing and use lot autocomplete on Google, you'd find mean, addicted to porn, depressed, you know, lazy, boring, dope. I guess dope can be both good and bad, uh, you know, but this is how much different um, those realities are in using these, these, you know, interface design tools uh, to sort of peer into what, what, again, we might think is reality about the world. And actually, this is somewhat a reflection of what these searches are, and also the text that's uh, sort of being um, mined in, in the data sets to sort of generate these kinds of tools. Um, so I want to now shift, that was sort of some of the concerns to be aware of, of course, as uh, as consumers and also as teachers of the public about um, search literacy. I think search literacy is one of the more important things that we should be teaching, but don't teach enough. And that's why when Marianne sent an email inviting me, I said, absolutely, this is something that we need to do a better job of. It's one of the th most important things uh, that we, we use every single day to navigate our information environments. Uh, and yet we really don't have enough formal education uh, being devoted to this. And so that's why I think we need to be aware of these new these issues um, that I mentioned and many others, of course. I wanted to mention those kind of things because they'll set me up for some of the other things I'm going to talk about for the rest of the talk. But I do want to shift now from sort of uh, you know general search engines to uh, search engines specifically for science um, and how um, 
challenge, you know, some of the same challenges that I mentioned before also can apply in academic search engines and recommender systems. Because one of the concerns that I've had for a long time is um, whether academic search engines are actually helping us navigate collectively the literature in ways that sort of are, are expanding our reach into the literature, or is it actually decreasing our view, like really basically narrowing our view of the literature um, because it's just delivering the same stuff based on the same kinds of kind of clickbaity kinds of um, um, sort of features of some of the search engines that we see sort of in the regular world. And so my colleagues and I started to investigate this question, partly because we don't want science. Sometimes we think in science, we, we, you know, we're immune to some of the things that we see uh, in, the, in the regular world. We're so good at sort of navigating information, we wouldn't be susceptible to the things that I mentioned before at the beginning of the talk, right? We're, we're researchers, we're scientists, we're scholars, we're teachers, we, we know how to do that. But I think you know, we, we have to be careful of not falling in love with our, uh, our own reflection in science and academics like uh, this uh, nar narcissist uh, painting by Caravaggio uh, really indicates where this, you know, this boy sort of basically, you know, never left the cave because he fell in love with his own re own reflection. Um, and I think we need to be careful of that in science and, and in research. And so stepping through sort of the, 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 the world of search and academics, we used to have that world and I miss that world. That's where I, when I was introduced to science and and, and to the library and to, to reading the literature was just going to the library and navigating the, the stacks um, in, in the physical world where I'd be looking for one book or one journal and I ended up finding other things and there was all this serendipity that could occur and there was all, you know, there was, you know, it wasn't as fast as our search is today, but it certainly led to all sorts of great discoveries and, and certainly didn't have some of the problems that we have with some of the digital world search engines, but there's also, of course, great advantages to the to the, the digital world uh, search that we have. But now we're living in sort of academic search 2.0, where in this case, we actually are um, using a tool that has a dual role. And this is important. In the academic search, search 1.0, we didn't have quite this dual role of search and evaluation. I'll talk about what I mean in, in just a second why, and why that's important. But when we did academic search 1.0 and walked into the library, we had a, a, you know, a lot of times a goal in mind looking for that book or that journal. And we still have that kind of goal with academic search 2.0, but the interface that we use has a form of evaluation too that then feeds back into that search and affects future searches by us and other researchers. So, um, and also I should say about Google Scholar because Google Scholar is one of the most well-known academic search engines. It's one of the most important tools in all of science. There's other search engines, but it is one of the more used ones. Here's the thing that's kind of sad about it. There's an unknown algorithm. We can make guesses, unknown corpus. We can make guesses, but don't really know the size of that corpus. It's non-customizable, it's non-extensible, and there's little community development around this incredibly important tool. And a lot of, and, and some people say, oh, Javin, you're a little over worried. They're gonna keep it around. But there are plenty of Google projects that have been killed. There's this great website that shows all the, basically shows the graveyard of all these projects that many of them I used to use, like Google Wave and all these, even, you know, Google Plus was supposed to be the competitor of Facebook and others. That was killed. I mean, just on and on all these projects. And this isn't just at Google. It happens at all these major tech firms. They, if it doesn't, you know, if it doesn't meet whatever they want, they can throw it, throw it out. And, and I've always been concerned that, you know, Google Scholar, given the importance of science, we should be trying to find other ways to, um, to build the, you know, search engine capabilities within our own community. But anyway, that doesn't mean I don't want Google Scholar to go away. I don't, and I actually think it's an amazing tool, but we need to be aware of some of these things. And there has been some efforts by other organizations, you know, uh, that are trying to build other search engines. You know, I'm here in Seattle and uh, AI2 has developed, uh, yeah, Allen, uh, Allen Institute for Artificial Intelligence has done a lot of great work with Semantic Scholar. Um, and there's been these other groups, but even this, look at this slide. I did this purposely, it's an old slide. Well, two of these aren't here anymore, Meta, Microsoft Academic Search is not here anymore, JSTOR at Clarity, and there's some others as well, but we need more innovation in, um, in academic search. I'm actually advising, and I'm, I want to put this down here just so you very know, I do have a conflict of interest here. I'm advising on a new, uh, uh, a new search engine called Consensus. This is um, a startup by a couple um, graduate students from Northwestern, Christian and Eric, who've been tr wanting to apply some of the newest NLP techniques in, in, in things like claim extraction to build a search engine where you can ask questions and it would surface claims 
that are these you know evidence-based answers and it's not perfect yet but it is one of many different projects out there that are trying to start to innovate in the academic search space so there is some innovation coming down the pipeline um, I, again, it's going to take a lot of work to get there, but I do think we need to be thinking about how to innovate in the search space, especially in the research world. And so there is some excitement, not just with con consensus and, uh, and other search engine, but I'll mention some other projects uh, that I think that, that I'm working on and colleagues are working on in this space that, that gives me some hope. So now let me get back to this um, issue of dual role of, of both search and evaluation. In science, you have this issue where are search science search engines where you know, well it's not just in science but in general technology amplifies social cues and so if you go to Google Scholar and you were to search stomatal conductance this is something I studied uh, you know in my masters I did a lot of biology research you would get all these different indicators there's all these indicators of uh, not just what you know the article title but things like number of citations the venue the individual. These are all sort of markers um, that can then feed into evaluation that then further feed in to what potentially could be the search engine result for someone else as as these search engines gather you know, usage data and then feed those back into to future search results. And this is important because this could be sort of um, uh, sort of pushing us into the same kinds of search results and not really expanding that um, that view of the literature like we were we always thought it was going to when when the literature was being digitized. And so you had um, I mean, this actually goes back to a very famous, you know, and well known um, uh, idea in sociology, something called the Matthew effect. It was something that Robert Merton and by the way, uh, was actually more of a, a an invention by Harriet Suckerman, which was soon to be Robert Merton's wife. And and then this is some, it happens very often in science where um, the woman uh, comes up with the idea and then <laughs> the man gets credit for the idea. But anyway, that's another story. Um, but this Matthew effect, the rich get richer, is something that I'm concerned about in science. It, those that start having citations, do they continue to get more citations because they're surfaced at the top of these search engines? And we can sort of test that idea by looking at how these distributions change. So if we take the citation distributions over time, <laughs> over the digital transition, do we see a more skewed or more flattened citation distribution? So that's a way of testing whether potentially technology or the digital transition is making, uh, you know, creating a, a situation where we have a larger view of science or a smaller view of science. And so, you know, my colleagues uh, have uh, in the field have tested this. So uh, James Evans in 2008 uh, tested some of these ideas. He looked at the electoral publication and the narrowing of science and scholarship after the digital transition. And he found um, actually something quite different than Vincent Lavier, which is another colleague of mine, where he looked at the decline in concentration um, of citations during that time period. And so, um, so he's got this quote, I'll, I'll sort of skip that, but here's the idea. So if you're looking at whether technology, and in this case, the digitization of the literature is narrowing science, you would look at this citation distributions. And if it was more skewed, you'd say, yes, it is narrowing. And that's what James found. Uh, um, but that's not actually what Vincent found. He found that looking at the same question, he found that the citation record was flatter. So I was I was interested in saying, well, well, who's right here? So my colleagues and I decided to look into this further. Um, Kate Stovall, Lano Kim, and Christopher Adolph, we wanted to see, um, you know, after an update, because they did this back, uh, you know, in 2009, 2008, 2009, 2010, what's happened over the last maybe decade, uh, two decades actually now, since we've gone through this digital transition, has it gotten, have we gotten more narrowed or flatter? And in the process of asking that question, we found that many of these papers asking this question about the narrowing of science actually were uh, misusing some of the inequality metrics that you use to test these kinds of ideas. So something called the Gini coefficient is used by sociologists and economists um, all the time. And it turns out that they, uh, that that was being misused because there's the, it turns out there's this there's this bias that exists in the metric for the kind of data that we use when looking at citation distribution. So there's two things going on. We were trying to figure out whether science is narrowing, possibly due to these search engines. You know, on the advent of Google Scholar, where do we then start to see some of this skewness in citation distributions? And then the second thing that's going on is that in doing that and asking that question, we found that the inequality metrics that people were using to ask the questions in previous years. Where they were misusing, a lot of them were misusing uh, that inequality metric. And by the way, they're continuing to misuse this. So we wrote a paper des describing both the bias and ways to correct for that bias and then ask the question. So this is one of the 
papers that we wrote. And I'll you know cut to the chase real quick and get to the answer because I have other things I want to talk about. But what we found is that if you look at the marginals, uh, marginals are essentially if you were to compare one time period to another. Um, so if you want to look at the citation distributions in 1996 to those in like 2016, you have in those uh, two different time periods different citations to give and different papers published. And if they're very different, it's hard to compare those unless you correct for these things. So if you see here, you look at the total citations and total papers are very different from 2014 and 1996. And that matters when you apply things like a Gini coefficient. And so if you correct for this Gini coefficient, you find in this case that there's not much difference in those citation distributions, at least when you look at all citations. We've begun to look at this actually when uh, looking specifically at citations across disciplines. And the answer there is a little bit different. We do start to see some, a little bit of skewness. And so the point here is that we, if you correct for this and you look at just all citations, especially within field, you don't see as much change in the skewness. Um, but uh, if you do that across fields, you start to see a little bit different. And we did this across various, lots of different fields. And then you, we also uh, just really um, show how you can do this correction. So the main findings for this work is that the bulk of the apparent decline in citation is, is really an effect of what's called this marginal bias. So when we look into these questions, and we'll continue to look into these questions, because it's important to see the effects of technology on search and um, and on how we sort of construct the literature, basically looking at how citations um, then are sort of distributed and how papers are credited through these citations. Um, and also the same will hold for some of these cross-disciplinary comparisons, but specific, like the more distant they are, we find that there, there tends to be some differences. And that's just some of the newest stuff that I've been trying to resurrect recently. But the thing uh, that we need to be careful of is when using these inequality measures, um, that uh, with lots of zeros, we have to account for these marginal biases. So the main point here is that when you correct for this, we don't see many changes. We still need to look further into some of these uh, citations that go across fields and whether that still is affected by, potentially affected by search engines. It's hard to make that causal link, but we can at least see whether that's changing over time. And that was a concern that we've seen and other researchers have seen. Um, but these are the kinds of questions you can ask of search engines, which can then um, potentially lead into some of the education that we give when talking about how to use search engines specifically in science. And of course, we ask questions about how NLP tools are affecting the narrowing of science as well. Now, more generally, I'm interested in sort of misinformation in and about science. It's one of the main things that I they study nowadays, um, both in science and society, but in particular in science. And, and of course, I look at the ways in which technology is, is, uh, is that gateway to misinformation, not just search engines. I do mention search engines, but, but, but it's all sorts of other changes that are going on with science communication that are being affected by this and potentially pushing, um, uh, you know, pushing misinformation more than we'd like in science. And here's an example. Early on in the pandemic, this particular paper was posted on the bioarchive, which was one of the, the biggest changes in, um, I think, in science communication over many, for the last many, many decades, um, we already had preprint archives for many fields like astrophysics and computer science and, you know, physics more generally, but we hadn't really seen a real strong uptake uh, of papers on, on preprint archives for the life sciences. And we did see that for, for uh, during pandemic, and this was an example of a paper that was put up early on. But what's interesting about this particular paper is that it was one of the most shared science papers of all time, but it was retracted. Um, so this particular paper, um, not long after it had been put up, had been, you know, essentially peer reviewed in the public. Um, and it was taken down because of errors in the, the analysis. And you can see here, here's a little red box. This has been withdrawn. And you can click here for more details about it. But it didn't stop this thing from spreading like crazy. And of course, search engines were um, unveiling this in search results all over the place in different languages. And of course, you know, if it's going to be one of the most shared articles, you're going to see it in social and social media and the news, you know, in search engine results all over. And so these are the kinds of things that we have to be aware of, again, when thinking about training individuals about, um, you know, what to look out for when just using search engines, but also in designing these kinds of interfaces and, and how they interact with things like preprint archives. And it doesn't mean we shouldn't surface papers that are on preprint archives, but we need to do a better job when they've been retracted, not to keep 
um, sort of uh, exposing those as one of the top search results um, that you find. And so this one, by the way, this continues to spread. And this is, you know, one of many different kinds of paper examples that you can find. Um, uh, and it's it's taking a while for even journalists themselves and even researchers to sort of be accustomed to this new form of communication, at least in the life sciences, where now papers are going on preprint archives. And it doesn't mean they're they're all wrong, but we just need to be a little more we have to we throw a little more caution at them um, because they haven't been through the peer review cycle. And of course, during the pandemic, there was all sorts of problems when it comes to science communication. And of course, what I do is I look for misinformation that comes wrapped in data and numbers and statistics. Um, and that sort of led to what the World Health Organization started calling early on in the pandemic, the infodemic. And it's something that more search engines can really be a real help uh, to sort of combating this sort of thing. And I spend most of my time actually in sort of the darker corners of the internet studying these kinds of things. And as Marianne mentioned, I'm one of the co-founders um, of what's called the Center for an Informed Public that we formed in 2019 to really focus in on this issue of misinformation and disinformation, both in science and society. And we have all sorts of projects where a lot of what we do is we, um, we apply computational social science techniques to these really large data sets, uh, you know, Twitter, uh, uh, Twitter graphs, for example. So we, we, you know, look at the, the large networks that form and break apart and, and get amplified on social media around certain topics. Um, we try to understand how those things come about. Uh, and we sort of build sort of graphs like this. Um, and we also uh, come up with different kinds of interventions. My colleagues and I, we recently put out a paper in Nature of Human Behavior, excuse me, that looks at the ways in which we can intervene in this kind of uh, like intervention strategies around misinformation. And Marianne already mentioned this book. I talk a lot, this, a lot about this um, uh, just sort of for the public. This is actually a book for the public. It's not a science book. It's a, it's a trade book that's meant to sort of empower people to become better consumers of information. And we do talk a little bit about search in there, but I, that's uh, we should talk about we should talk about it more. But we also have projects where we um, build real time. We we call them basically um, rapid response. Um, kinds of, we build rapid response networks to major events like elections or, you know, natural disasters, where we try to figure out ways to apply these research techniques um, in real time to issues or to, to misinformation to sort of slow it before it spreads too far. To address this thing that I mentioned early on, uh, this Brandolini's asymmetry principle, where it's easy to create bullshit, hard to clean it up. So we want to clean it up as quickly as possible. And this was an example. We actually, I was, our group was up, you know, 24 hours a day, it seems, all last week working on this and the election before, and we're building this model for sort of monitoring misinformation during the election. And so during the 2020 election, um, based on this same project, my colleagues and I decided to audit Google's search head, uh, headlines during the 2020 election. Um, to see whether it be, really was a potential gateway to misleading content. So I'm going to talk about this paper. This will be the last thing that I talk about in the talk, and then we can get to questions. Um, but I, but I want to go a little bit slower through this one, just to so you can see at least some of the work, the kind of work that we can do with search engines. Um, and I think it's one of the more important things we should be doing in our group was, is doing more auditing of these major tools that um, are the gateways for people to um, to gather information, especially during times of uncertainty and um, and times uh, where you know misinformation you know flows in quickly to these vacuums. Um, so what we did is we wanted to we looked at about eight hundred. Well, first of all, this is from uh, students in my group and my colleagues, uh, Kate, Ryan, and Jason. Um, and uh, Martin and Hamanchu and Morgan. So I want to really credit them uh, with with this work as well. Um, and what we wanted to do was uh, we wanted to invest. You know, we were of course concerned about some of these issues of uh, uh, illegitimate delegitimization um, in the election. And I should mention that nearly two years two years after the 2020 election, over 30 Americans still remain convinced that the election was stolen, including over two thirds of Republicans. It'll be interesting to see how much that's changed following this current election, but we're only, a, you know, less than a week out from the, a little over a week out from the election. So we're still sort of trying to figure out where, where, where we are at this point, but still a big issue. And several studies have detailed how misinformation and misleading information spread on social media platforms prior to and following the elections. And few studies have extended this analysis to include search engine, despite their popularity and the importance of those tools for gathering information about whether, uh, you know, an election um, is, 
trustworthy or not. And so these are the kinds of things that we wanted to search. We wanted to, you know, can the search bar serve as a gateway to misleading content? That's essentially what we were after. So what we did was not look at the actual content. We did sort of um, focus specifically on the content. We focused very much on the result, the sort of top results that that Google uh, provides when searching for certain terms, certain election-based terms, both problematic search, in, uh, uh, search terms and sort of standard search in terms uh, around an election. So in 2020, 65% of Americans use search engines, the primary source to gather news and information. 90% of it was, was Google search. And so that's one of the reasons, of course, why we use Google. It's not hard to convince, uh, I think, the readers why we chose Google to for, for doing this particular study. And election results in coronavirus constituted the top two search terms on Google search in 2020. So we weren't searching something that, you know, it was on the sort of long tail of searches for Google, this is something that, you know, was one of the key kinds of things that people were looking for, of course. So our guiding aim here is to determine what if and how Google search services could serve as a gateway to content may have undermined trust in election process. That was really what we were interested in. So specifically trust and trust in institution and the results of the election. So when you do a search, you find, as we all know, that usually search engines, you get sort of these groupings of search results where you might get local news, you get related searches, people ask, videos, et cetera. And these are the kinds of ways that we broke up the study. So these are the questions that we were asking. We wanted to look specifically at the medium of information. So um, how do the search engine result verticals, search results, stories, videos differ in the amount of misleading content? Um, we wanted to look at the location of search. As we all know, searches are, uh, the, a lot of times these searches are customized for our region, uh, prior search results, et cetera. Unless you're in incognito mode, um, a lot of times that occurs. And sometimes that's helpful for finding things, but sometimes it can lead to even more misleading content. So we wanted to know whether location actually matters. So how does one's location in a specific city or region, especially in an area where there might, uh, you know, might be a swing state uh, where there's a lot more attention, uh, did we see different election uh, result content in those areas versus other areas. We wanted to look at the phrasing of search keywords. So do different search terms, general versus conspiratorial ones, lead to different search engines results? Uh, excuse me, I was just going to check my time. I'm getting very uh, getting close to uh, the end. I want to make sure that you're like, well, I want to ask a question. We're going to get to the questions in just a second. Um, and then we also looked at media domains, which media, online do media domains served as the most frequent gateways to the content. And by the way, these are the search terms we use election results, ballots, and, and we explain in the paper why uh, you know, we use these terms, and then some of the conspiratorial terms that we used as, used as well, ballot harvesting, dumping, rigged election, et cetera. And these are the regions around the country that we used. Um, and we gathered about 800,000. Um, uh, uh, we, we, we audited 800,000 search queries during this time period. So we use these 20 search keywords, 20 locations, four times a day. We were gathering this four times a day. Uh, we used a stratified sample for periods of two weeks, um, and we had we looked at 1,600 videos, our stories, 1,600 videos, and searches, and 800 ads um, across this time. So um, the coding scheme we used was we looked at stance, so two primary dimensions, stance and promotion. We wanted to see whether it's so distrust in parts trust, just provides just basic information, uh, whether it promotes or does not promote um, these kinds of um, issues that I mentioned earlier. So that, you know, here's, here's an example, just to give you a sense of what might promote distrust. Guns, lies, and ballots set on fire. This is voter suppression in 2020. Something that promotes trust is election fraud claims are baseless. These are the kinds of things, and you know, we looked at, you know, of course, thousands of these, but these are just some examples that we looked at. So we looked at um, the medium information, as I mentioned, and as we thought, as you know, this is probably the most concerning thing is that of video, videos were the, the promoted the most amount of distrust. And you can look at this over time. So here you see this blue line. Um, it promotes uh, more distrust. They had a dis disproportionate amount of undermining trust content compared to search, res uh, search results, stories, and advertisements. And part of that is that videos are harder to um, uh, to check automatically. Uh, that's, you know, that's part of it. I mean, it's, it's easier to check text nowadays because we have tools to throw at text um, and even uh, just st static images, but videos are harder. And so that's one of the big take homes for us was that we need to do a better job of, of sort of identifying these issues in, um, in videos, especially with the rise of things like TikTok and Instagram, where that's kind of the primary means of communication. Um, so that's, a, that's kind of a, a big deal in that case. 
Turns out location, uh, which was a little surprising to us, um, but it turns out that the, 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 you know, there wasn't a lot of differences in, at least in the problematic content when it comes to locations. The only thing we did see is swing states received more campaign advertisements than you'd see, but the user's location did not moderate the quality of information. So that was a good result. And overall, actually, I, I will say this, we did, you know, through this auditing exercise, Google did actually quite well for the most part, uh, especially on terms that were um, not terms that uh, were sort of looking for, you know, the rigged election kind of results. Um, but, you know, overall, it did quite well. It was just mainly on the videos that, that were some um, issues. Um, you know, in terms of this is not a surprising result. This is something we would expect, but we wanted to check for it. If you look for conspiracy terms when doing these, uh, this auditing of search, you look and you look at the percentage essentially of, of headlines undermining trust. Uh, you find, you know, of course, the terms that were in our list of problematic search terms were where you found it. But what was interesting among the, uh, that, and again, you can look at the paper for more details, there were some terms that actually were uh, much more promoting of um, uh, undermining trust content. Um, so you look at like mail dumping and, and why that's the case, you know, why voter fraud, for example, had far less and actually was closer to some of the results even of just standard search terms. So that was, you know, um, an interesting sort of result. So what what to serve users if they actually search for conspiracy remains tricky. Um, and that's no easy thing if you are Google or any search engine for that matter, because, you know, you're trying to find whatever your, your, your user is finding and you don't want, you know, you don't want to censor too much of the content. Uh, or, you know, this is a whole discussion right now, right now, you know, on the, on, in the policy realm about, you know, where, uh, you know, should we be deplatforming and should we be doing any kind of censorship? And, um, and that's, that's for a full other discussion. And I'm happy to go into that during the, the questions. Um, but that's sort of um, the, one of the results there. And then of course, the media domains, everyone sort of contributed to this. And, and I, I, and just even this, the, the really, you know, of course we did find, a lot of problematic content from some of the domains uh, that you'd expect here on the right, but you also did see some problematic content from some of our national ones uh, as well. Um, and a lot of that's due also to the fact that they're they're surfaced higher more often. Um, but but it also does say that they're not sort of immune to these things, even the sort of standard ones that you'd expect uh, to see. Uh, you know. Um, uh, in uh, you know in our, in our media lands, landscape. So given that Google has been found to overwrite a third of its headlines identifying the sorry, given that Google has been found to overwrite a third of its headlines, identifying and finding the misleading framing should be a priority. Uh, is one thing that we also wanted to to take from that as well. So I think one of the things that we uh, you know you know wanted to do after doing this research, and I and I'm, I just blew through. So of, of course the uh, you know what took us you know. <laughs> Many, 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 many weeks of work to try to, to put this research together is that it's important that we refine scheme as it should be built on existing COBIC so we can su successfully continue to do this kind of auditing. And we need to be able to do auditing and we need more increased transparency um, from a lot of these search engines so that researchers can do this kind of work. Um, and sometimes it'll show good results like parts of the study they did and, and they'll, the whole, there'll be other things that we might find that hopefully will inform some of these search engines and you know they're doing their own research too but in a, in a time when we can't just rely on Facebook and Google and others to sort of uh, you know, do, doing everything in our best interest which we know is not the case um, that we need to um, I think that's one of the things that we'd like to push for um, is to you know and we have been in the research community pushing for more transparency and accessibility to do these kinds of audits so that's uh, you know that's the that's the, the the talk so far I know it's I, I wish I was in person so I could see everyone the, you know and uh, and try to uh, be able to interact you know in a way that I could sort of see where you might want to continue to talk more on cer certain parts of the studies that I mentioned or or dig in deeper into other topics but I'll just say that search engines and science and society are indispensable we know that I didn't talk about all the great ways that they help us navigate the world. They do amazing things for us. And, and I don't wanna take that away, but I do wanna mention that we need to be aware of the ways in which they can be gateways to misinformation. And in particular, uh, based on the, the discussion at the beginning of the, the talk and some of the new advances just in the last couple of days, uh, that we need, to, uh, we need to provide new opportunities, but also these NLP uh, uh, large language models are gonna provide new opportunities for search, but also new challenges. So with that, I'll end um, and open up for questions. Thanks so much for listening. Okay, we um, we have a couple 
Let's see, we have one question um, so far and people feel free to, to put um, additional questions in the Q and A um, or in the chat. So we have a question that says, given that search engines is often the first stop of information discovery on the internet, is there any meaningful way to change the status quo aside from improving the information literacy of average web users? I think that's a great question because, um, you know, our knee jerk reaction is just to go to the search engine. And before we even uh, sort of, uh, you know, start to ask any questions before we do our query, uh, you know, we're already typing in and we get something and then we're sort of pulled in by the, the, the query results and the interface in front of us and the headline, the catchy headlines and the clickbait that's going to arise, of course, from this, that I think one of the best things that we can do in the education world is just have people pause a little bit more before they go to the search engine and try to anticipate what they might find, what some of the problematic things that might occur um, to try, you know, you know, of course, we're not going to go to the physical library to ask the kind of questions we used to. I mean, it'd be great. I still do. I love my local library. Um, but we, I think we need to do a better job of teaching and, and creating these habits of mind for ourselves, too, to be um, more aware and to think a little bit before that, that search query gets inputted into that search bar about ways in which, um, you know, that you, you could be misled. So the question of, like, what other tools you could use, I think the other thing is to do what people sort of call lateral reading. Um, and that's this idea of opening, you know, sort of multiple tabs, looking at multiple sources, which means multiple search engines as well. I'm not saying that, you know, Google, of course, is a really powerful search engine, but there are other things that we can search um, that sometimes Google doesn't pick out. So let's say you're looking for articles in the Wall Street Journal, there are search capabilities internally that might differ a little bit from the results you'd find on Google, even though sometimes Google is better than people's own search, internal searches into their own content. But the idea is that we should be thinking about lateral reading even at the first step of search. So the point is we do need to be thinking about some of these things other than just putting in a couple search queries and thinking that, or search terms and thinking that's sufficient. So I think, um, I think you um, sort of answered the next question, which was, can you uh, recommend additional, additional uh, search engines that people might, that people might consider? Well, I'll mention, at least in the academic community, this is because it's a world I know very well, and this exists in other communities as well. It's not just academic, but in academic search, there's things, of course, there's Google Scholar, there's Google itself, there's, um, there used to be Microsoft Academic Search, but that doesn't, Semantic Scholar is one, there's this consensus that's building, you know, Clarivate has, in the Web of Science, has their search engine, there's all sorts of engines in academic in the academic world that we can use as ways to, to peer into different parts of the information environment. Now, other search engines, like in the regular world, of course, there's things like DuckDuckGo and there's, there's Bing and there's, um, uh, you know, and there's, you know, search engines even that are being accessed when you use like Alexa, for example. Um, and those are, uh, those are integrated in some, <laughs> into some of the same search engines anyway. Um, of course, Bing is the dominant search engine. And, and that's, you know, in some ways a little problematic. Uh, I can't change that at this point, but policymakers are thinking about some of the implications of that sort of thing. And, and, but, but, but I can't, I can't ignore the fact that Google is incredibly powerful. I mean, I, we, I use it a billion times a day. It's just that I think we should, as professionals, um, information science professionals, thinking about search literacy, we should be encouraging others to at least, at least look into some of these others. They may not even compete with Google, but just the fact that that society knows there are other windows into the, the world is, is really important. In fact, like when I talk to my parents, for example, I think they only know that there's just this Google and it's the, the default page that they have on their web browser that they go into. And they're, I think they, they think that's the only window. And, um, and I need, you know, I even need to do better with my own parents as I, as I think about your question. So I, I yeah, I think we should uh, be encouraging people to try other forms of search, but if they're going to use search engines, understand what, uh, you know, what, what kind of problems can occur when you do search for certain kinds of terms. And this is like, again, this is why we need to have more seminars like this. We need to do a better job of both teaching the public how to search better and to do more research on the effects of, uh, of, of search on what we find and don't find. Uh, that, that, um, 
that's super interesting. It's awesome what you just said. I'm going to clip that. But I'm going to, I have one. Um, I have one question maybe to to wrap up with, and I had two. I'm going to try and put them together. Um, kind of, have you thought about uh, gray literature at all, and searching in gray literature, and how that might be evolving? And then, can you just kind of tie that up with anything else that's next that you're thinking about that um, that you don't have time to get to yet? Are you going to focus on this auditing, or what's the big picture of your next of your next projects? Yeah, so you know, it's interesting you mentioned the, the gray literature because one of my first big projects um, in in sort of thinking about uh, you know the like if you looked at products like the Web of Science, for example, um, a lot of what was what is uh, what is gathered and then produced in journal citation reports and and it's it's you know is now in you know the Web of Science search is this sort of course core corpus that there's used to sort of do the search. But there's all this gray literature that exists. In this case, it would be newspapers and other things that sort of don't find themselves into the sort of core corpus that's used to do search. Well, that's the same in sort of other aspects of, of search. And that's why you're bringing up gray literature. Um, and I think I, I wish I had a better answer about how we could do a better job of peering into that, because a lot of it's just simply not accessible. Um, but I, you know, I do think that if we could, if we could at least allow, let the world know that what's being indexed is still a very, very tiny portion of all the information that's out there, whether it's things that are being curated in museums, whether it's things that have not been scanned, even if it's things that have been digitized, but aren't a part of the corpus because of maybe Google doesn't have rights to have to, to scan things that I think it's important for the world to know there's so much more than just what's given by, even if you had everything that was given by, if you wanted to know everything about stomatal conductance. There's only so much that you can, even if you were in a robot and you could read everything that was given by Google, there's still all this other stuff that's out there as well. And so I, I, just, I just, letting people know that I think is interesting, whether there are great tools for doing some of the, the search into the gray literature, I think is, is a, I, I'm not as aware as much. I think maybe, maybe people in this group might know better than I do. Um, but yeah, so I think that's that's an interesting question. Actually, I would turn that back to you, Marianne. What what do you think on uh, what do you think on that? Well, the the um, kind of the my thought behind the question was not so much about all of the information that's not accessible and indexed right now, but the but the the stuff that is. And there's I know that there are um, that there are gray literature uh, search engines that are starting to maybe yes, or, or databases. Yes. That are starting to come about and so i'm wondering if there are things that those engines that, that those specialized engines could learn from what you are thinking about that would make yeah. that, that would make the information in that that would make those search results and the serp um more uh qualitative yeah if that's I, mean, appropriate. I love the question i'm i'm not as aware of some of these tools i know they exist out there and i have colleagues that have done a better job looking into it, but your question may, is making me think. Actually, why why don't we actually work with some of these groups too that are, uh, you know, kind of almost not building from scratch, but sort of are in the development phase of of making this kind of content more available to more specialized search engines? I think it's a great question. I haven't done it, but maybe I should. Maybe we should. <laughs> Something to think about. Yeah, and yeah. As I see a question here. I can certainly provide slides and. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's there. Uh, these questions about like the gray literature are, are really interesting questions. Okay, I think we have. Um, unfortunately, we've we've used up all the time that we have for this for this webinar. So um, let me first of all thank you. I'm going to grab the screen from you. Okay. And just um, first of all, thank you, Jevin, so much for for giving us uh, this talk. It's, it's um, been really informative and and just um, excellent, and a great way to wrap up the speaker series for um, for fall twenty uh, twenty two. This is the last talk that we'll have um, this time. We'll have a, We'll have a new organization. We'll have a new um, series that will start in January. Uh, in the meantime, uh, Jevin's talk will be uh, will be. Um, Published on the Search Mastery Interest Group website and the um, and the University of Maryland I Schools YouTube channel, um, and he says that he'll give us um, he'll make the slides available, so we'll publish those um, as well on our 
on our website so that people can follow up because I know there's a lot to go back and uh, listen to and find some of the some of the papers and review the the content that um, that Jevin gave us today. So thank you um, again, Jevin. Thank you everybody for uh, for joining us. I see one more thing in the Q and A. Oh, it's just a thank, a thank you. Oh, thank you. Yes, thank you, Carol. <laughs> thank Carol. You. So, yeah. So, um, all right. Thanks, everybody, and we look forward to seeing you in the um, in the in uh, January. So, thanks again, Jen. Bye, everybody. Thanks so much, man. Take care. Yep. Bye, everyone.